Good morning, everybody. It's good to have you back. It is a <clears throat> blustery uh, February day. I am recovering from microfracture knee surgery that I had uh, just a few days ago at the end of last week. And uh, it's really painful. Uh, I've, I've taken a break from my, my rehabilitation uh, to come over and record this lecture. I'm going to record um, two other lectures this week for you as well that deal with wave propagation theory. Um, but uh, before I get into wave propagation, I wanted to do uh, an introductory lesson on um, some of the ways that, that we engineers um, quantify and represent uh, harmonic motion or wave motion. Um, this, this, so the title of this lesson is called vibratory motion and, and really that, that relates to like a harmonic motion. So if you think about these cool little gadgets you see on people's desks like balls swinging from, from wires or, or these things that are just fun to sit and watch for hours as they entertain you. Uh, it all relates back to vibratory motion and, and we're going to discuss today some ways that we can represent this type of motion mathematically. So um, when, when we analyze complex problems, particularly dynamic problems like earthquakes, the, the best solution, the best thing to do is to typically break the larger problem down into several um, simple and solvable problems and then combine the results of those simple problems together to create the uh, results of a more complex problem. And, and really that's what is at the basis of what we're going to talk about today is we're going to we're going to break these complex problems down to the most basic form of motion which is just simple harmonic motion and we're going to try to understand that motion and with the goal that we could then combine different types of motion together to create or represent a more sophisticated or, or complex type of motion. <clears throat> I, I love this quote uh, that's attributed to Leonardo da Vinci, which is, uh, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. You know, I, I think of like my iPhone or I think of my Apple TV remote when I think of this quote because I remember the first time I got an Apple TV and I, I looked at the remote control and I had like two buttons on it and I thought, uh, uh, this is ridiculous. How am I going to use this? And, and whereas my television remote had no fewer than 70 buttons on it, uh, to this day I still don't know how to operate my TV but it is so simple and nice to operate my Apple TV with that little two button remote. And so uh, we're going to learn some of the, uh, I guess we'll call it the Apple TV remote of ground motions and uh, that will allow us to do some more sophisticated problems here in the very near future. So let's, if we could take all types of vibratory motions, earthquakes, uh, ball swinging on a, a wire, uh, any type of machine vibration, any type of vibratory motion at all. And we can break it up into two general categories. The first category is what we might call periodic motion. And periodic motion means that the motion repeats itself. <clears throat> so there's a pattern. So you know it's obvious in this plot here that you see a repeatable pattern. But we could take an even more sophisticated motion like this one over here. And even though it's more sophisticated, you can still see that there's a pattern that repeats itself. So that, that period of repeating is what we refer to as the periodic motion. Now there's another type of motion. Um, oops, excuse me. So uh, the, before I move on, the, the most basic type of periodic motion is what we call harmonic motion. And that is just a simple cosine or a sine wave of a uniform amplitude and a, a uniform frequency. So the most basic of all motions is periodic harmonic motion. Now the second type of motion, uh, vibratory motion, is what we call non-periodic or more commonly we use this term transient 
transient motion just means that it's kind of like uh, out of the blue. It's unexpected. It's not repeated, but um, it's, it's something that happens. So for instance, this is a, a, like an impulse loading, something we might expect from an explosion or, or uh, getting bumped by another object. Uh, or we might expect to see, of course, a transient motion being like an earthquake motion something that might look like that. So uh, transient motion is non-repeating um, and it's much more complex and sophisticated. It's more difficult to model. So one of the easiest tricks we can do is to um, we can fool an analysis by taking a, a transient motion and making it periodic by just adding repetitions of, of whatever that transient motion was uh, following a quiet zone. So we'll add a quiet zone and then we'll add uh, these repeats of that transient motion. And so all of a sudden now we've taken a transient motion and we've converted it into a, a harmonic, or I'm not a harmonic, a periodic motion. And that allows us to do quite a bit of um, analysis with it <clears throat> in a pretty simple way. So let's get down to the most basic of basics and, and let's just have a look at simple periodic harmonic motion. So this is just a cosine wave or a sine wave. Now there's, there's different mathematical ways that we can represent this simple harmonic motion. Uh, the first mathematical way is what we call trigonometric notation. And so if we just imagine a plot of a sine wave and it's going to have some sort of phase transformation, it's going to have some type of circular frequency and it's going to have some sort of amplitude, we can plot this wave and, and off it goes forever. Uh, and, and a lot of people, especially a lot of young students, prefer this type of notation and this type of plotting because, well, it makes sense to them. The downside to this is that this line here goes on for infinity. It goes on forever, but we just cut it off. And so you see that we're actually representing a very small uh, physical representation of this wave. And so there's, there's a lot more efficient ways to represent um, this notation trigonometrically. Uh, another one of those would be to use something similar to an Argan diagram, where in this instance we have a, a real component. This would be the displacement of the wave, and that's going to be the y-axis. And then we have an imaginary component, or a non-real component, and that's going to be on the x-axis. And what we have is we have a vector and that vector has a certain ampli or uh, it has a magnitude, and the, the magnitude of that vector is equal to a. And it's spinning at an angular velocity of omega. And so at any given point, the height of this vector, the, the vertical component of that vector, shown here, is uh, the height of the, our of our sine wave so to speak. And so you can picture then as this vector spins around 360 degrees, its, its vertical component increases, increases, increases until uh, right at this moment here, it's perfectly vertical. There is no horizontal component. So that's the peak of our sine wave uh, with an amplitude of A. And then it, it continues to, to decrease, decrease when it is uh, perfectly horizontal like this. Every, uh, all of the vector is in the imaginary domain, so we have no height to it. So the value of our sine wave is equal to zero. Uh, and then it continues down going in the other direction until eventually it, it reaches the bottom of our, of our circle here. So now it's the bottom of the sine wave. And around and around it spins with no end. So you can see that this might be a more realistic representation of that sine wave plot. But it requires you to do some mental uh, thinking, some imagination, uh, where you have to plot in your mind that sine wave, so to speak.
So um, this approach right here uh, is what we call a rotating vector representation. And, and in this instance, there's no phase angle. This is just, uh, uh, just a simple notation with a, uh, the, the um, angular velocity and, and time, of course. So uh, if we were to plot then um, a, another approach, this would be what we call alternate trigonometric notation. And, and this gets a little more complicated, but it allows us to deal with a little more uh, sophisticated waves. So this then is the summation of two different uh, simple harmonic waves, a sine wave and a cosine wave. And if we add them together, then uh, we, we still get a harmonic wave, but, but it can be a little more sophisticated. And so um, in, in this notation, we have the first wave, which is a cosine wave, and, and that's plotted um, right here with this dashed line. And then we have the second wave, which is a sine wave, and that's plotted here with this dotted line. When we add the two together, is uh, what we end up with this solid line right here. So again, we're, we're, we're plotting this graphically as you might on like a piece of graphing paper or something and, and we're still limited by the fact that this is an infinite wave, it's an infinite function, but we cut it off. So we're not doing a very good job graphically representing that. We can represent it with our spinning vectors, but because we have two functions, we have a cosine wave and a sine wave, we need two vectors as well. So this first vector here uh, is, uh, represents our cosine wave, and it will have whatever amplitude uh, A. And then we have our second vector here, which represents our sine wave. Uh, and its, its amplitude is equal to B. Now remember, again, uh, we only care about the vertical components of these vectors. That's the real component, or the displacement component. And these vectors are, are spinning uh, often opposite uh, directions that are opposite to one another. So this vector might be spinning in that direction, and this vector might be spinning in this direction, uh, each at their uh, respective angular velocities of omega. In this case, we're showing that they're spinning at the same angular velocity. But the summation of the vertical components of each of these vectors is therefore our displacement function. So again, this is our rotating vector representation. <clears throat> now, um, a lot of mathematicians, they, they shy away from this trigonometric notation. It's just bulky, it, it's complex, it's hard to use, uh, and instead they like to uh, use uh, more complex notation. So this is using complex numbers, where uh, using Euler's law, we can convert everything to complex notation, where now we're using i, which is the square root of minus 1. It's an imaginary number. And we can still plot the exact same function, but now in a much more elegant way. So uh, if we were to plot this using our rotating vectors, we'd end up using our GAND diagrams, where now we have um, two vectors. Um, one is spinning clockwise. One is spinning counterclockwise. And the summation of the vertical components of each of those vectors gives us the real component. So again, we're only looking at the vertical component of each of those vectors, and we're summing them together to get the real component. Everything that's in the x direction is uh, imaginary, and, and so it, it's not real. But you can see how the height of those two vectors added together equals the height of our uh, sine wave. So when both those vectors are at their apex, um, in other words, they're here and here, when we add those together, we're going to get a vector that is uh, equal to the full height. And that gives us the peak of our wave, of our harmonic wave there. So that, that's how complex notation works. And, and even though I know 
Um, conceptually, most um, normal people hate complex notation because it, it, the idea of imaginary numbers does not make sense to them. Um, mathematically, it's much more simple. And so a, a lot of mathematicians will rely on complex notation to solve um, wave equation problems. So let's dive now into a topic called Fourier series. So we introduced the topic of a Fourier series uh, a few weeks ago. And uh, the way we introduced it, we said that a Fourier series allows us to break a complex periodic function into a simple, uh, into a series of simple harmonic functions of various amplitudes and frequencies. So uh, let's just do a quick review. So if I have a time history, um, and let's just say that this is, uh, we'll say that's displacement as a function of time, and this is time, and I have some time history that looks like this. Um, I can break this wave into a series of, um, let's see, into a series of waves, of harmonic waves. And what I can do is I can, I can look at all the different frequ all the different possible frequencies of a harmonic wave and say, how many of those frequencies are in this, uh, this wave right here if I were to make this transient motion into an equivalent periodic motion? And so what we might see is something that might look like this which might tell us that at this frequency we have a wave that's equal to this amplitude and at this frequency here we have a wave that has this amplitude and at this frequency here we don't have uh, very much amplitude at all and so it's a way for us to represent um, complex transient motions by using a summation of a bunch of harmonic motions of, of certain amplitude and certain frequency. So that's what the Fourier spectrum is. So, and the reason we like Fourier series is because it's very easy to an, an, analyze the individual harmonic motions at each frequency from the Fourier spectrum. So analyzing the transient motion is hard, but if we can analyze each independent uh, harmonic motion from each frequency that's much much easier to do. So um, in the Kramer textbook uh, Geotechnical Earthquake Engineering and in the appendix section A3 there's a, a great derivation that you can look at that will talk about the various forms of Fourier series and uh, if you're not familiar with Fourier series I, I recommend you go read it. It's not a long read but it's really really informative and I think it will help you. So a couple of the things that that section talks about are some of these different forms of the Fourier spectrum. So the first one we want to talk about is what's called a Fourier transform. Now a Fourier transform, all it does is it's a mathematical function that takes a periodic motion, in other words a motion that repeats itself, and it breaks it down into a series of harmonic motions. So it, it converts a periodic motion into a Fourier series. So um, there's, there's different solutions, there's different, um, I guess I will call them mathematical recipes to perform these Fourier transforms. Uh, typically what we're doing is we're taking a record in the time domain and we're converting it to a Fourier spectrum in the frequency domain. So the x-axis becomes frequency um, and is no longer time. Now a discrete Fourier transform, this is uh, one of the great contributions to the field of electrical engineering and signal processing. It's, it's a numerical approximation of the Fourier transform and it's based on summation rather than using mathematical integration. And so uh, as long as you have a computer that can sum lots of things quickly, then it's very, very fast and very, very easy. 
And so uh, with the invention of computers and calculators, this DFT, or the discrete Fourier transform function, became probably the most widely used function for performing Fourier transforms. Uh, it's, it's very, very common today um, and numerically to use with, with machines and then in signal processing. <clears throat> Another uh, big advance in uh, computational signal processing was the introduction of what's called a fast Fourier transform or an FFT. This is, uh, again, uh, it, it's similar to the DFT, but we're making more computational assumptions, uh, and it's incredibly fast. And so uh, with computers today, it's instantaneous. We can develop, we can go uh, to a Fourier spectrum from a, a periodic uh, motion instantaneously. But what if you want to go from a Fourier spectrum back to a time series? So we want to go the other way. And we can do that doing what's called an inverse fast Fourier transform, or an IFFT. So this is an algorithm that just goes the other way. It goes from a Fourier transform back to um, a periodic wave motion, typically in the time domain. Uh, and so this is really useful from, from converting back from a, a Fourier series to a time history of an earthquake motion. So why introduce you to all of these things? Well, because as we move through this class, we're going to get into the topic of uh, site response analysis. And, and we're going to talk about how uh, waves moving through different uh, media are going to be amplified or filtered or de-amplified and, and so when they come out the other end the waves are going to be significantly altered and uh, one of the easiest ways for us to deal with that is through the use of Fourier spectra so um, let me show you how that might work the idea is we're going to take an earthquake time history and um, we're going to make it an equivalent periodic time history. So we're going to uh, effectively uh, try to copy it um, and, and repeat it uh, off for infinity. But uh, we don't do that. The, the computer, the machine does that. Then what we're going to do is we're going to apply a Fourier transform, a, a fast Fourier transform. And we're going to break it into a summation of all of these different harmonic uh, waves. And then um, we can analyze each of those waves individually. So analyzing any one of these waves is super easy. We can do it uh, with, a, with a simple equation. So we can analyze e the response from each of these waves and, and we'll have thousands and thousands of these different frequencies and amplitudes, but it doesn't matter because with machines it's it's super fast so we're going to analyze the response of each of those components and so we're going to end up then with the response of our system whether that's like a site response or a response of our vibrating structure whatever that is and then if i want to um, put that back into something i can understand with my uh, with my simple and, and uh, layman's brain then I can convert it back to a time history by doing an inverse Fourier transform and sum the responses and go back to the time domain. And so um, this is uh, essentially a snapshot or a sneak peek into how we perform um, uh, elastic uh, site response or even equivalent linear site response. And so uh, a lot of site or even structural response is, is analyzed in this way. So uh, to give you another example of how that might be, it's, it's usually more convenient to solve for um, structural response in the frequency domain than in the time domain. And by structural response, what I mean is if I have a structure that's being affected by an earthquake, and instead of taking a dynamic model and running a time history through it and stepping through the time history and watching how each node 
and each element in my model moves relative to the others. You can imagine that takes a lot of computational power to do that, and it does. But if I use the frequency domain instead of the time domain, it solves the problem much, much easier. Here's how we would do it. We're, we're going to use transfer functions to represent the response of our structure or our soil column uh, for this class. So in this case, maybe I have a base ground motion that uh, I convert into the, uh, the frequency domain. So this is my Fourier amplitude spectrum. And then I have my transfer function for the structure. And, and what this is, is it shows how my structure vibrates or resonates at different frequencies. So it, get, it represents the response of my structures to, uh, to my structure of, to a whole series of frequencies of loading. So if I take this Fourier spectrum and I multiply it by this transfer function, so each, each frequency multiplied by its corresponding frequency on the transfer function, I end up with some uh, product of those two in uh, the frequency domain. And this is the structural response of my structure. So in other words, I can solve the entire structural response with, with almost a single calculation. It's just multiplying these two functions by each other. Then um, what I can do is use the inverse Fourier transform to transform this uh, this function right here back to the time domain and it will give me then a, a displacement time history of my structure. So um, this, is, this is what we call frequency domain analysis and it's a really powerful tool that we'll deal with uh, more later in this class but, but this is intended just to give you an introduction to it. Anyway, that's uh, all I have for you today in, in introducing you to the topic of vibratory motions and, and how we represent those mathematically. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the lecture and, and we'll tune in for the next lecture, which we'll get into discussing um, wave propagation. So thanks for your time and I will catch you next time.